Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's free preview of What a Cartoon Movie for the end of Evangelion. I am one of your hosts for this one, Bob Mackey, still pondering the fate of Pen Pen, who is here with me today. Hey, it's Henry Gilbert, and it all comes tumbling down in this week's podcast. It certainly does. And in case you're new to this whole thing, so every month we do a thing called What a Cartoon Movie. It is a mega long podcast, two, often three times the size of one of our normal podcasts. And if you're on the free feed or the $5 feed and you're listening to this, that means you're getting the extended preview, which is a big chunk of that even gianter chunk waiting for you behind the ten dollar <laughs> paywall at patreon.com slash talking simpsons that's right where we've covered so many great films in the past last month we did waltzing rum and curse the were rabbit in the giant back catalog there's films as diverse as spider-man into the spider-verse akira a goofy movie tiny tunes i spent my vacation beavis and butthead do america and so so much more over two hours worth of animated feature film chat that me and bob have done and you can only hear all of those if you're a $10 and up subscriber at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. That's right. And now we have just formally entered our third year of doing What a Cartoon Movie. So if you've never Ooh. heard What a Cartoon Movie before, there are two complete years of episodes waiting for you behind the $10 paywall at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And this one, I got to say, End of Evangelion, it is <laughs> a complex film to talk about. And I do believe we haven't counted it yet, but I do believe it is, if not the longest, tied for the longest. Yeah we've ever done tied with space jam yes we just recorded the entire nearly four hour movie discussion segment and i want to say i hope this topples space jam (laughs) it'd be fun to say end of evangelion is the new number one yeah but uh uh, but yeah i think you guys will really enjoy it obviously also spoilers for the evangelion series if uh you haven't so please watch end of evangelion uh first before listening to the full thing but uh before that you guys should uh check out this little preview of what you're missing uh where we talk about the history of the creation of this film and it's a it's a really interesting one not just in the japanese release but also the american and worldwide release of the film so again if you want to hear the rest of this podcast and get the previous two years of what a cartoon movies head on over to patreon.com slash talking simpsons and sign up for the ten dollar level but that's all we have to say for this uh, intro to the free preview please enjoy this free extended preview of what a cartoon movie for the end of Ava Evangelion. Let's get into the history of the film itself. How do you even end up with something <laughs> as truly, let's say, either bold or bonkers as the end of Evangelion? Well, you have to put yourself in the state of mind of a very stressed and unhappy animator <laughs> by the name of Hideaki Anno. So, Uh, To really get the context for this, you need to know where Anno and the Evangelion production was at nearing the end of the television run in early 1996. So a major goof I did last time was talking about how it was a Gainax Tatsunoko co-production. It really was more like Anno chose a small handful of his favorite artists at Gainax, took them to Tatsunoko and made that show there Hmm. so gynax was making the video games and the toys and all the merch that's where they were making the money from but it's really a tatsunoko thing and there's lots of other reasons for the production delays and problems but part of it also was working with a production company they'd never worked with before at tatsunoko pro this is also potentially why the film release would end up going with production ig instead of tatsunoko i think they only really worked on the death movie because it was their footage anyway Evangelion had a later than planned debut in October of 1995 because there already were production delays. They stack on top of each other more and more as they go. And that leads to like the 14th episode being a clip show. Like the 13th episode ends with really this midpoint ending that Anno had dreamed up. And then after that, they really don't know where they're going. They're running out of time and budget. Yeah, I will reiterate what I said on that earlier podcast in that uh, watching it again as an adult, I really like the first half a lot more. (laughs) As a younger person, I thought the like 
oh, not traditional. It's thrown in your face, man. I, I, I thought that was so much cooler as a kid, but now I can see it as the result of uh, trouble production. <laughs> and trying to make it work as best as possible. And also, like, uh, Hideaki Anno fusing with Shinji Ikari to such an extent that they became the same character suffering in the same ways. And there was a knock-on effect, too, that as the schedule was getting impacted, that's also when the series was taking off in popularity. Mm. Like, it wasn't an out-of-the-gate rating success, but it was building and building more momentum into 1996. And as the bigger ratings came, so too was the first merchandise and the album selling really well. And they were getting more and more attention, which then the show was never censored as far as I can tell by TV Tokyo, but the bigger attention made it. So when they had the episode 18 with the rivers of blood coming out of unit four or the dialogue only off screen sex scene in episode 20, Mm. which really was just a cover for, you know, to save some money. Both of those were very controversial. Like there were moral schools who felt this is too dirty for an animated series to air on television in 1996. As the series is coming closer to closer to the deadline of a final episode and ending the series in March, the staff was feeling sharply exhausted. Like there's regular anime level production (laughs) of exhaustion and they were far beyond that. Assistant director Kazuya Suramaki said in a 1997 interview, and I have a lot of quotes here. The majority of them are fan translated, but I feel they are reliable. But I will put that caveat there. These are not official English release translations by the company. But Suramaki said in a 97 interview, the schedule was an utter disaster and the number of cells plummeted. So there were some (laughs) places where unfortunately the quality suffered. However, the tension of the staff as we all became more desperate and frenzied certainly showed up in the series. He continued, about the time that the production system was completely falling apart, there were some opinions to the effect of, if we can't do satisfactory work, then what's the point of continuing? However, I didn't feel that way. My opinion was, why don't we show them the entire process, including our breakdown? And Suramaki, who'd go on to be the Fooly Cooly guy, he also mentioned that creatively, this was one of his favorite times because mm. he's felt like when I am pushed to the absolute limit, I'm doing my best work. Though, I got to think a lot of the people who also are working at Evangelion, I bet they weren't feeling that way. Meanwhile, another insight into the brutal time it was there came from a 2011 English language interview with, at the time, Gainax's sole non-Japanese employee, Michael House, Mm. or at least sole native English speaker employee, I'll say that. Michael House, we talked about him some in the Bubblegum Crisis podcast. He was one of Animago's first employees and then got hired by Gainax. Gainax like... We should probably have somebody from America who can tell us how to sell stuff there. Michael House offered his own insight into why the TV show is breaking down. Otto wanted his characters to start from a damaged place and change, presumably maturing and becoming better, and becoming better, more self-sufficient human beings through their struggles and interactions with each other. But he created characters that were too damaged and insular for that to happen in any believable manner. (laughs) And instead of getting better, they got more screwed up as things went on. So that was, I think, the realization that starts to come like when they do episode 16, which is just Shinji trapped in a world of his own making and going through like horrible depression and everyone is upset. That's how they're feeling. All the people making the show are feeling that. And their frustration is coming through in the show. To give another example of how rough things have gotten, production of episodes 20 through 24 have multiple scenes cut or just lacking that will then get redone and expanded upon in the death movie Mm. that then gets shoved into director's cuts of the episodes, which is how it appears on Netflix which I think you experienced watching it through on Netflix. In the old DVDs, they gave you a choice of like, here's director's cut and here's broadcast. Right, but but I guess they did a Lucas and and they're like, well, this is the definitive version of it now. But at least you don't have to buy a different kind of DVD. You don't need to buy like the platinum version of Netflix (laughs) to access those. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, the director's cut episodes do look better. They're they're better in just about every way and just embellish scenes. I think those scenes are are a bit overplayed. The actual real content that they add is not that substantial, Mm -hmm. really. They just make things look better like when unit zero is overtaken by the angel and you know uh, it's gonna have to self-destruct you see the little faces of ray popping out that that fits with what happens in the end of evangelion movie 
I was thinking more in terms of like the new content that's added in that scene of Asuka and Kaji. Is it Kaji? Uh, Kaiji. Kaiji, uh, Kaiji or no, Kaji? Kaji or there we Kaji. go. On the ship. I got it mixed up with a gambler. <laughs> they both have the same haircut. On the ship, we see them arrive properly in the story. We see those two together. Yeah. An uncomfortable, intentionally uncomfortable scene of Asuka trying to seduce Kaji, not like politely turning her down. So yes, as they're working on 20 through 24, they finish up episode 24, which already you watch that one again. This is... Everybody makes fun of the elevator scene, but there's lots of scenes like the elevator scene. Episode 24, which I actually love, has, I think, about 50 seconds of still animation yes. that, that is played as tension as just Beethoven plays over it. And as they're working on 24, they've got their script for episode 25, which is 10 times more ambitious than episode 24 because it is the human instrumentality project activating and it is the end of the world and they are realizing that even on a normal production that would be close to impossible at where they are now there is no way they can animate that so how can they possibly finish the show? I think that in the broadcast versions of this story, when the end of the world is implied, it was just like subtitle, like, and then the world ended. And yes, then uh, let's yeah. not talk about that. Let's move on. Instrumentality. Quickly. Yeah. So what they do is they put everyone in a dreamscape, abstracted world of like just no backgrounds and characters and just have their subtitles, not even having many characters say it, but just present instrumentality is happening elsewhere. The end of the world is just off screen, but you can't see it. But but know that it's happening <laughs> i think as a presentation of ideas it's not bad but it's not the finale they knew they wanted to do it's so fucking meta and as i've heard you correctly point out to bob that it is a very light reading of freudian stuff too like it feels like folks who had just started to learn about psychology yeah as a kid it was fun to watch but after you take one psych class or one like philosophy class you're like boy this is just like basic bitch stuff isn't it <laughs> and on top of that there's like literally unfinished drawings they just put in yeah they're just like no this is the trailer for they do for like next week's episode at the end of 25 is showing you like the script like yeah. it's just written text on screen it's funny how even the next episode previews break down where it goes from clips to animatics to storyboards to the dialogue like yeah. someone shooting the script but that is what suramaki was talking about show the breakdown like that i will say when i rewatched the entire series with my husband I found more I liked in the ending than before. For me, self-interrogation about self-hatred is interesting. I did really respond to it, but I would be lying if I said I wasn't one of the extremely disappointed fans who watched that on VHS in 1998, even having been warned, no, these last episodes are weird and they're not an ending. Even then, I was still like, boy, I, that really was not an ending. I paid 30 bucks for this not ending. <laughs> yeah, I did like it more watching it as an adult. I think when I watched it as like a, a late teen, early 20s person, I thought like, eh, just a bunch of cool animation and ideas. But now mm -hmm. watching it again, I'm like, well, no, it's trying to say something, but it's kind of facile. Mm -hmm. But I can see why they did it that way. But I prefer the movie interpretation of it. So I found a couple folks who worked with Anno that brought in their reasoning of why they think it fell apart and why the at last episode was the way it was. Toshio Okada, Gainax co-founder, who I believe is the stand-in for the main character of Otaku no Video, he was at a North American, I believe, con in 1996. So the movies are not even announced. They might have been announced, but the end of the series had just come out. And he's asked what he thinks of it. He says... In Nadia, Otto couldn't decide on an ending. It wasn't fixed until three months before the final episode was shown. So subsequently, I was confused about Nadia, and there was a lack of control over the various episodes. And, and Okada was his producer on Nadia. He wasn't the producer on Evangelion because he left the company in 92. Uh, so continuing Okada, Evangelion is a very great series. I think it's one of the top anime ever made. But the last scenes were not were never fixed. When I talked to Anno a month ago, he said he couldn't decide the ending until the time came. <laughs> That's his style. Anno and his staff couldn't make a good idea of it. He told an anime magazine in Japan that he couldn't make what he wanted because of the schedule or the budget, but that's not correct. I talked with Mr. Yagama and Mr. Ano. They said it's not only a problem of schedule and budget, it's a problem of what the ending is going to be. Ano couldn't decide. 
Okada also mentioned that Otto shaved his head in contrition right after the finale aired because he was like, the, I apologize. Like shaving. Did he in, go, yeah. did he do one of those like down on the floor bows like where you, you scrape your head against the ground? Oh, uh, He didn't mention that, but then he said that that was just Otto's way that at first he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Then months later, he's like striking back at fan questions. And it was in this Okada interview came the story which i still don't know how true it is it's the only like source i've seen but the story was that Anno went to an english a convention in north america and he was asked like hey this ending kind of sucked and he replied in english too bad yeah it does sound apocryphal mm. i like to get like a recording of it or something because i just i can't believe it it's too perfect yeah that the this okada interview is the only time i've seen that like actually put in in a story and even then it's just his interviewer saying yeah you know at a convention he just did that so it's still just it feels like a game of telephone to me i want to believe it it's a it's a great story also, side note, in that interview, Okada talks about how The Simpsons just premiered in Japan huh. and how he's like, oh, I really like it, but it's only for otaku. Like, a Whoa. Japanese person watching Itchy and Scratchy Land won't get it, is what he said. <laughs> Meanwhile, Michael House had his own version of events of why he thinks it all fell apart. I spoke with people working as closely as anyone with Anno during that latter part of the production and broadcast in particular, and they volunteered the information that Anno was just trying to find some way of putting a smile on Shinji's face by the end of the series. Hmm. After he was brought to the hard realization around episode 12 and 13 that the characters he's created weren't capable of whatever positive change in outcome he originally envisioned. Time has only reinforced my impression that the problems were with Anno and Ava itself and that their failures cannot be reasonably attributed to malevolent outside influence and so again that's house was working some on the show but he was there so i again think it is like the production issues didn't help but it said Anno didn't know what the series wanted to be and i mean that old smile on the face thing that is the final shot of yeah. episode 26 like and that shows at the core of what they did with 26 was to finally give Shinji a realization that made him happy and realize like, I want to live, smile. That's how far he had to go yeah, to get to that. Mission accomplished, I guess. <laughs> that was your goal. So the feeling internally was that the move from 24 to the aired episode 25 made no sense. And if they had made the original version of 25 that they had thought of, that that could have at least bridged into those episodes and it would have made sense. So they planned that like, you know, this script, if we had a movie budget could actually just be made into the story we need this to be. And then it'd make the final two episodes make more sense if we just did that episode 25. So some of the earliest stuff I saw seems to indicate that while they knew they were going to do a movie because the show was so popular, they it was going to get a movie. It's a popular anime show. You always do that. But I do think the original thought was Death and Rebirth would just be the movie and they mm. just make the 25 script they did and then just say there, there's your bridge into the finale that the show was. So is the Rebirth section of that movie the 25th episode script that they wanted to make and it just yes. cuts off there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's why it's called 25 Air in the, oh, in the okay. movie. It's to be considered as the 25th episode they would have made. Then technically the other two-thirds of the film of end of evangelion is called episode 26 but it clearly grew into something else at that time oh yeah uh so yeah my research confirmed the suspicion that they were working on the movie as the tv series ended or they at least knew they were going to make it but i couldn't find any concrete statement that they were like while working on the last two episodes they had the assumption that we will make a movie that will explain stuff you can see in episode 25 quick cuts to yes ritsuko's uh coat in the lcl or a bloody misato which is then followed up on in the film yeah i mean i saw those knowing a movie existed uh, those, those little like tantalizing clues of what's really happening mm -hmm. i can see how that could drive a fan insane like <laughs> misato's dead yeah what, wait what, <laughs> what go rewind please let us show, show us what happened she's the most beloved character and like oh well you get to see it eventually yeah so that does make me think 25 and 26 while an emotional climax i gotta think somebody in the production was thinking this is a stopgap. we all know the real endings the movie this is though to get us something that can air on tv as a last episode 
the last episode's broadcast spin out of there is that some people actually do kind of like it in the Japanese fandom in 1996. I found interviews of the creators saying like, oh, some got it that they're like, ah, this is like the challenging episodes of Nadia or Gunbuster. Mm. Like this is just of a piece of Gynax. It's not a giant mistake or lazy or whatever, but they were definitely not the only people who react to it. And some people harshly rejected the episode. Some very angry anime fans, as you'll see in the film, <laughs> sent Hideki Anno death threats defaced a gynax property i don't know if it's like a gynax store or like their main office front but some person with red paint wrote death and awful things all over it in anger about a disappointing ending that's what i heard about first i didn't want to read spoilers about the ending but as it was getting farther in my vhs watching i was told people hate this ending you know i mean i knew that going into the series like get ready for a terrible ending yeah that's basically what the the warning was up front and as they start approaching the film, another thing to consider about who Hideaki Anno really likes is Yoshiyuki Tamino, the creator of Gundam. And especially on his series Ideon, but both Gundam and Ideon, they did a compilation movie which spruced up scenes from the TV series and was presented as like, oh, this is the ultimate expression of it. And on top of that, Ideon, actually, I've never seen it, but I heard the ending of it is what gave End of Evangelion the guts to be as mm. crazy as it is. I believe you have that, don't you? I do. Okay. I, I got to break out my Blu-ray. This is not it, me yeah. shaming you because I, I just want to watch it and possibly borrow it from you. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, I'll, I'll lend it to you, Bob. Uh, but so... They originally planned a compilation film in that same style with new scenes and clean up some stuff. And then it will be teamed up with that real finale that they're going to make and just release that as one film. And they'd work with Tatsunoko on reusing the old stuff. But Production IG, who was fresh off of the Ghost in the Shell film, they get hired to be the production, the main production house, but there's a lot more than just them, but the main one on episode 25, Air. But as with all things Evangelion, it instantly spun out of control and also turned into a giant problem. So here's series producer Toshimichi Otsuki from King Records. He was on the King Records production side of it. We had been working on the movie version while the TV series was still running for the first time, hmm. but I knew by the end of 96 that we weren't going to make the deadline, so I made the decision to create two movies. So Only in Japan could you get away with that. Yeah. That, oh, the film's almost out. You know there's <laughs> going to be another film, and you do have to pay a lot of money to see it a second time. Like, what if Avengers Endgame, uh, if you can remember that movie, an hour of it was like clips from every Marvel movie, and then you get the first <laughs> third of Endgame, and then uh, you have to wait another, I don't know, six months to watch the rest of Endgame. After you've paid a lot of money to see a first-run movie in Japan. <laughs> also worth noting, Otto isn't actually the director of Death and Rebirth. Mm. Like, he has chief director position but he's actually not the lead creative on it his two assistant directors on it masayuki and suramaki they are the directors death is directed by masayuki rebirth by suramaki and so ano meanwhile i think is trying to recover from mm what he was feeling at the end of the movie but then once the deadline was starting to be missed that's when he came in and was like I am the main director and creative lead on the real finale. And he would then write and direct a brand new finale that would take themes from episodes 25 and 26, but also reflect on everything he'd gone through since that premiered. And also clip show movies were fairly common in Japan at that point. I don't know if they still do them, but mm. it wasn't all the time, but occasionally like the Nadia movie was a clip show. Yeah, Future Boy Conan had one too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think they eventually stopped doing them because I just don't see them anymore. But yeah, they, mm. they, they happened. I could see in the 80s and even into the 90s, just the idea of is an attraction in america i think that's always been treated as like cheapo like there's the joke in simpsons about the itchy and scratchy movie being like 30 so percent new material yeah because even in america they had they were doing that like yeah. the old like bugs bunny movies were that because they just wanted to assemble shorts and there's like the heathcliff movie was a bunch of <laughs> clips right yes yeah wait that looks like shit the first time at least evangelion's drawings blown up on the big screen look all right even if it's still the tv stuff but i will say death and rebirth 
the death parts at least finds an interesting framing device and i think they realize Kalru matters more than he did in the way they treated him in the show and they can recontextualize some other things and also since they were working on the rebirth half at the same time they were able to more explicitly set up plot points that they need Mm. in rebirth that they didn't know they'd need at really episodes 20 onward so yeah Anno is working much more on a brand new ending that also based on early versions of the script that leaked online they didn't change a ton of it the most of what he wanted is up in there and it includes like a lot more sexually explicit and violent stuff that you couldn't get away on tv the tv show had pushed the limit as far as you could go in 96 and then the movie's like no we're going even farther i guess he wrote the movie was it traditionally written as a script and then storyboarded or did he storyboard it first like was do you have any idea about that part of the process based on that leaked script i think it was a written Hmm. you know uh, text script that then got storyboarded i don't think Anno. Anno's a great animator and i think he definitely boards his shows but he's not like miyazaki writing this one too bored i don't know if he does that with other ones but from what i saw the storyboards came after a written script and also Anno clearly took inspiration from the bleak endings of animes of his youth including ideon and also devil man like light spoilers for devil man but the end of this is kind of like 75 percent the same as the last chapters of the gona guys original devil man comics uh and so i think he remembered these dark finales leaving like lasting scars on him as a nerd and he then gifts that to the next generation <laughs> with his incredibly dark ending. I've seen a lot of, we're at election time right now. We just passed it, actually. A lot of parodies of the final scene of this movie. Yes. Uh, yeah. Depending on whose giant head you want to see, there's a parody <laughs> of it. That is a stirring image, isn't it? Yeah. Like that cover. You just see two people, one standing, one sitting, and then looking at a thing. You know it's the <laughs> end of Evangelion. And I mean, that that was the cover of the DVD. It's sort of like having the Statue of Liberty as the cover of the uh, Planet of the it, Apes. It's exactly yeah they're you're just right. like ah, the iconic spoiler scene you just know it it's yeah, fine you, you all know it it's more about a question of how do we get there and so they finished death and rebirth and released that in march 17th 1997 i think partially just to hit a deadline that they said like no this is when this movie comes out so you are done with this much suramaki directs the air episode 25 ones he was able to get that one done and released and ready for march 17th 1997 which is almost a year to the date of the final episodes airing and right around when the vhs's were coming out in america and it does really good money like it makes a ton of money producer otsuki thinks about it reflecting on the release he said Without a doubt, the hardest thing was when we couldn't make the opening deadline for the movie back in 1997. We couldn't release the complete work and were forced to bring out a movie in both the spring and again in the summer. Otto saw never apologized, though. <laughs> The end result was that we got almost the same amount of people to watch both movies, which made the distributor Toho very happy, but it was really rough to make the decision to split up the story. Even then, we still had to work up until the very last moment to get the second movie out on time. I went home to catch up on some sleep without even watching the movie. Jesus. I mean, well, it is a gorgeous movie. It really is. Yeah, I mean, you can see not just how ambitious like some of the best animators who worked on the evangelion tv show go even buck wilder in this and they also hired some of the best like key animators <laughs> freelancing in the business plus you had production ig who were already doing great high level production on ghost in the shell continue on to end of evangelion oh i laughed because i was just thinking of how good the animation is in the oscar fight scene yep <laughs> and let me tell you something i mean they still exist but 2001 was the era of the anime music video mm. and you saw a lot of anime music videos set to that Asuka <laughs> fight scene including Du Hast. Oh, of course Du Hast, yeah. of course. But I yeah. swear to god like that was like one out of every 5 <laughs> anime music videos. Like before Naruto started and you had all oh, of those, yeah. it was this. Yeah, it was, it was this yeah. scene. That it's cuz such a good scene. Like yeah, I think it was Cowboy Bebop that was or Trigun started to supplant it, but it was that fight scene. Before I saw the movie, I kept trying to download it off a website
websites, but this is pre Kazaa. But I could find an upload of just that fight scene. So I did download that and watch it. And I was like, wow, this movie must be pretty awesome and full of crazy fights like that. I didn't realize it was the only fight in the movie. And Same they, here. <laughs> that they make that fight so cool as their apology for like, and this is the last time you'll see any cool fights in this movie. So the final release of End of Evangelion came on July 19th. It combined the first third of the film is the rebirth section. So if you just wanted to see the new thing, you're like, you got to sit through that jerking off scene one more time. You can show up late, right? <laughs> and also, I mean, it's incredibly ambitious. They put the credits in the middle of the movie. You're right. Like, yeah. And so Otto's new ending came in hot and heavy. And thanks directly to the five lead voice actors in it for going above and beyond the demands of the director. I'll get into that in a little bit, but it was barely made it into theaters on July 19th. I read another interview with Suramaki who was just like, uh, we should have not even done this. This is a retread and it, it was exhausting. That explains why like Fooly Cooly was the next big thing he did. It was yeah. just, like the most different thing from this ever. <laughs> he was finally free to also just make his own thing. Yeah, it did get a bunch of awards and went at the box office, but still in 1997, some native fans and also abroad still balked at it, but they're like, well, that's it. There's no more of it. It's the end of Evangelion. And I did want to talk a little bit about Suramaki as well. We definitely covered him in Fully Cooley and the Nadia one, but he was like the top assistant director to Ano, along with Masayuki. That's why they directed both. Ano is just so much the soul of Evangelion that Suramaki and Masayuki get looked over quite too often in it. If you see a cool drawing, it's usually because of them. Yeah, I mean, and it's, we talked about Heathcliff earlier. If you like that opening to Heathcliff, uh, Suramaki worked on it. Right. That's like yeah. one of the first things he did. <laughs> um, so he drew that sexy Cleo cat plenty uh, of times. Oh, man. It's especially, man. Same with Masayuki animated on the Thundercats opening, like the Chitara spinning the pole thing. Like, that's him, man. And Suramaki was on his protege and worked on Nadia. And so getting to direct his first film with Rebirth was a pretty big deal for him. I really do think if you consider end of evangelion as two separate films directed by two separate people you really get a sense like oh yeah 25 feels like suramaki because he's got a cool fight scene and also <laughs> the, the his part is everybody's dragging shinji to make him do something i think that is exactly yeah. how he felt of like ano get your ass in gear i'm trying to make this evangelion movie also i did find an interesting interview uh, about what he thinks of Gainax and its many anxious and unhappy male protagonists. Suramaki said in a 2002 interview, the directors at Gainax are all basically weak, insecure, bitter young oh men. Oh my God. <laughs> so are many anime fans. Many Japanese families, including my own, have workaholic fathers whose kids never get to see them. That may influence the shows I create. It's one of the darkest so, things I've heard. <laughs> I know, right? He's like, yeah, all you are losers, and I know because I'm a loser too. We're all damaged <laughs> losers, hurt by our fathers. Let's make anime. <laughs> also in that interview, he confirms that Anno and Shinji are the same person pretty much. He's like, yeah, they, they just fused into one in the show. It makes me wonder if Suramaki and Masayuki are like, are they Suzuhara and Kensuke in the show? Or like, hmm. who are their analogs? Definitely Masato getting everything done. That feels like Suramaki to me for sure. Yeah, he said Shinji was written to be so despondent in his half of the movie because that's where Ano was. Yeah, he also reflected on Ano in this way that I think is really interesting. Suramaki said, Ano says that anime fans are too introverted and need to get out more. He should be happy that non-anime fans are watching his work, right? But when all is said and done, Hideaki Ano's comments on Evangelion are that it is message aimed at anime fans, including himself, and of course <laughs> me too. In other words, it's useless for non-anime fans to watch it. If a person who can already live and communicate normally watches it, <laughs> they won't learn anything. God. So... That is the message of Evangelion. Stop being so insular. Stop being inside. That's the end of 26 and the end of this movie. Both have the message of like, you do need to be around people sometimes, mm. you know? I still haven't learned that lesson. So <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I think I disagree. Well, Otto, 
I know also he's saying it to himself, but he also doesn't mean it. Like I read another interview where he was honestly sounding a little conservative of just reflecting on like the Japanese man is broken after World War II. We need to find ourselves again. And mm. and I was like, dude, you're the fucking loser who owns a, an Ultraman toy collection. <laughs> like I read your wife's manga about it. Like, that reminds me of a recent uh, thing I saw on Twitter of people asking Miyazaki what he felt about Demon Slayer. Oh, yeah. It might take over the, the top ranking in Japan and uh, beat spirited away he's like i'm just an old man picking up garbage leave me alone <laughs> leave me alone <laughs> do you watch the show no i'm too busy i'm yeah. taking out garbage i'm old leave me alone following end of evangelion follow on to karikano and then finally get to do fully Cooly as his own thing but in 2007 along with masayuki he'd follow on to the rebuild series which is basically what he's been doing for the last 20 years the poor bastard should have went the trigger damn it i wish he had but he's so indebted to Ano. i think i think he does feel a certain ownership over evangelion as well and he's the director of those movies him and masayuki kind of okay. share co-director credit while Ano's like executive producer but i mean he's still like the key writer on it and stuff one of the many tragedies of 2020 and this is a first world problem complaint of mine but I did really want to go to Japan and watch the last movie in a theater. Well, it's an American problem. We're too diseased for any country to let us in, even ones we share a border with. I know. So yeah. they're like, uh, you could stay in America. It's fine. <laughs> but with how long it takes for those rebuild movies to come in. What uh, if we send you the movie in, uh, let's say, three years? Yeah. So also special credit on the film. I want to shout out to the five lead voice actresses that Ano thanks personally in the opening of the film. Megumi Hayashibara as Rei. Ooh. Megumi Ogata as Shinji. Yuko Yimamura as Asuka, Kotono Mitsuishi as Misato, and Yuriko Yamaguchi as Ritsuko. Those five, and especially the first three, are asked to do so much in this movie, above and beyond what a voice actor has to do. I can't believe Misato, these women all did different roles, right? But yeah. Misato was Sailor Moon. Yeah. Uh, and Masato is such a way different role and demanding so much more of her and she really she really does it oh yeah and I mean Megumi Hayashibara having to be like to find something in the character of Rei who is just yeah. so flat and that's like, her playing against type like yeah. she normally plays like the spitfire and then you know Asuka's character she has to scream so much and then Ogata oh my god is Shinji the scream she has oh, to do yeah. like a throat rupturing scream in this film that is just incredible and and on top of that most of those actresses they also filmed what is essentially an 11 minute short film in live action with yeah them that's too, right which i watched it for the first time in prep for this i'd never seen the full thing it's basically on a like oh i have a digital video camera and i like woody allen movies so it's just like it's women talking about relationships a lot much. of that digital stuff from the late 90s is pretty embarrassing yeah <laughs> i can see it from Ano's standpoint i read interviews where he said it to the fact of like it takes so long to make an animated movie having a digital camera that can just film shit and then it's a movie felt so freeing to him it's why after this movie came out he just made like i think three digital only films in a row and it was a little while before gynax got him back to to animation yeah so the actresses did such a great job on there too it's a big hit july 19th 1997 in theaters comes out on vhs and laser disc in japan a big hit too but what about america the most important country so after the U.S. release of the TV series with ADV finished, a lot of American fans, like myself included, were like, hey, ADV, where's the movie? Like, they had a public email, and I remember sending them like, so where's that movie at? Isn't there a movie that ends this thing? And ADV was very noncommittal through all of 1998 even. I mean, I wonder if it was like fierce bidding wars or ADV was expanding in a huge way. And it seemed like Gainax wasn't entirely happy with ADV or how little yeah. they sold it for because they were just like, whatever, America, who cares? <laughs> I'd always heard those rumors, too, that like Gainax didn't like ADV for their edits or anything i did see michael house in an interview he's like i didn't translate these things and i don't know what was going on with adv it's not my call though he did say that he found out one of the production companies i think either king records or tv tokyo they tried to sell the series to adv without gynax even realizing it so i think that got them off on a bad Ooh, foot yeah but i asked friend of the show michael tool and his recollection of the events and he was covering it at the time was that it was as simple as Gynax wanted a ridiculous sum of money for the movie yep. and ADV wouldn't pay it. Like 
over a million dollars in the six figure seven figure amount which no anime unless it's akira sells enough to cover a million dollars or more of a licensing fee that's why like really until recently anime was stuck with the japanese model but much much cheaper in terms of the price per dvd or blu-ray but it's like no you get two or three episodes per mm. disc and you'll pay like two hundred dollars for an entire series over time yeah because companies like viz where they were stuck they like they couldn't sell it for a better deal than the people they were licensing it from also because of a fear of reverse importing if you put out a much cheaper and better version of something in america that it, japanese hardcore fans that know that they can import the american version for cheaper that has all the same languages and it's the exact same content then they're just going to do that and that's why there were so many delays of classic anime for the longest time yeah mike tool he pointed me in the direction that ADV was kind of playing a waiting game with Gainax of like, we're not going to license it for that much. If we wait a couple of years, maybe when it's not new in Japan anymore, you'll bring down that price some. ADV, they frankly licensed too many things. And I mm. think they could have just not licensed 20 things that would have sold <laughs> like 2000 copies each and just went for this after the downfall of ADV, like a lot of their records came out and you would be surprised by how little a volume of some random series would sell like 800 <laughs> copies good lord like man. uh did you watch the goemon anime that they brought over like <laughs> all of this they licensed so much stuff if they would have just like not licensed 20 or 30 things and just brought that over that would have totally made up for it but no they wanted to have like the shotgun approach yeah to they, licensing yeah. i get it in a way it comes from the same way of thinking of like if i buy ten thousand dollars of lottery scratch offs then one of them's got to win a million dollars that doesn't actually happen though sometimes and sometimes as much as you want martian successor nadesco to be the next evangelion it's not god yeah when i was reviewing anime in 2001 to like 2004 or 5 adv was playing ball the most with review sites and in the giant box of anime that i would get shipped to me every month full of all the review stuff adv was like 80 percent of it wow. and i'd be like what what the fuck even is half of this stuff i mean that's smart of them if you get the weeb reviewers on the internet to write up your thing that's better than than you can get in advertising and cheaper it's just the cost of sending a dvd to somebody but so to a lot of outsiders like me in 1999 it was becoming very clear this wasn't going to be coming out anytime soon so i think it probably had the knock-on effect of getting a lot of people to buy fan subs or download fan subs and discovering how easy that is that wouldn't have otherwise bothered like i think people just went well the only way i can see end of evangelion is if i learn how to get a fan sub and yeah. now that i know this mystic art i'll just keep repeating that and companies like adv they would judge the popularity of a series based on how many you know downloads the fan subs got which is why it's like okay everyone loves Azamanga Dayo. we brought it over and then people are like yeah i saw that fan sub three years ago i'm exactly, done exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> even and i thought they did a really good job with Azamanga Dayo, but yeah most... i just rebought that uh, dvd set <laughs> it's for real a... cheap yeah i bought that goabon one for four dollars just because i could <laughs> But yeah, it wasn't until late 2000, I believe, because I found a review from when DVD finally came out and it said it was nearly three years ago that it got announced. So I believe it was late 2000 when Mong Entertainment just told people, didn't even put out a trailer, but just said, we got the end of Evangelion rights, which Mong Entertainment, it fits their model so much better because ADV really is license every possible thing you can Mong entertainment they are <laughs> we have three releases a year but they're all giant yeah and of course ghost in the shell they're one of their first big hits yeah yeah and I, and I was thinking just like i saw the dub in like fall of 2001 it wasn't until the next year there must have been some like home video thing in japan like we mm -hmm. need to have this exclusive in japan for this span of time and then you guys can sell it i don't yeah. see why a year would have passed before they could actually get it out to people because i think in 01 the dvd version was kind of new because it only had laser disc and vhs at first and then the dvd version came later i found an interesting video just explaining how bad the manga entertainment dvd is or specifically yeah. the video transfer and 
then some choices were made for that dub that were unfortunate. Some like cartoony splat effects mm-hmm. and they had to recreate the sounds of the Avas themselves. Oh, the howling and yeah, stuff. Yeah, because the audio tracks and the music were delivered on the same track. Uh, so oh, it's geez. like they had to recreate like Ava sound effects and stuff. And Amanda Winley was the director yes. of that dub and people were very upset with some choices she made. But they got, I believe, almost everyone back, including the voice of Misato from the first dub. Yeah, so they, they got back the four key people. They got Spike Spencer back as Shinji, Tiffany Grant as Asuka, Allison Keith as Misato, and Amanda Winley as Ray and also the voice director. And would yeah. you believe Tiffany Grant was at that convention? Oh, no. You couldn't keep her away. No, no. she was. She, uh, I'm pretty sure she still goes to every convention. You can find her on Zoom, probably. Oh, yeah. I bet she's on Cameo. I oh. bet she'll call you a dumb idiot in the Asuka voice. She'll call anyone Baka for $40, uh, let's say. Instead of those lines, I think of her saying, like, oh, I love sushi in the classic <laughs> Oh, that's her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I I will say I did appreciate the manga entertainment did their best to hire the ADV voice cast in in most cases. They couldn't get back like Gendo or Fuyutsuki or the Sele guys. I still say Sele. In the new dub, they say Seal, but it's just... It should Sele. be Sele. <sighs> but I'll talk about that in a sec. But yeah, I appreciated that manga entertainment went to that trouble because I think they accepted, and I swear I saw ads at the time even acknowledge it of like, we know you've seen this in Japanese, but will you pay money to hear the dub guys finally do their version? And uh, I did buy it. I did want to hear the dub cast with their version. Of yeah, it. I think I bought it even after seeing it live uh, just for the full experience. Though, man, talk about marking time. When I finally saw that by the end of 2002, I was thinking like, I am a completely different person than the person who watched Evangelion when it was new in 1997. I mean, 9-11 like, happens. 9-11, we had invaded Iraq by this point. All of this like 1997 end of the world stuff in the movie felt different or like naive, I guess, on a certain level. And also I was out of my teens and was like, I don't know, I feel different depression than I felt in yeah. my teen depression. I was like, I, I guess I'm an adult now. Now. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> See you. 